Magnetic induction. So we are beginning to see the unification of electricity and magnetism here. Uh, I like to call ENM, electricity and magnetism, the simplest example of a unified field theory in physics. And the reason I'm all booga booga with unified field theory is because those, that's the term that people use if you're trying to be Stephen Hawking or you're trying to be a string theorist and come up with a thing that unifies all the forces of physics. Well, great, fine. We're just unifying two of them, electricity and magnetism, into the electromagnetic force. Magnetic induction shows you how you get EMFs, which really is the result of an electric field, because an EMF is a voltage, basically, from just magnetic fields, with no electric fields immediately present. All right, so the first problem, uh, let's make sure I'm all situated here. The first problem, um, consider the generator as described in class, show that you get the same direction of current flowing both by considering the forces on the charge carriers in the wire and by applying Lenz's law, which we talked about in class. Well, okay, once again, we're going to have a current loop moving around in a magnetic field. So I'm going to bring in a 3D model of a current loop. All right, so you see we have the X, Y, and Z axes. We've got a uniform magnetic field pointing entirely in the Z direction, and a loop of wire which is currently oriented parallel to the XY plane. At the moment, nothing is moving, so no current is running through the wire. What's different this time is that you can see that I've connected a wire to this loop down at the bottom with a resistor. The loop of current is the generator, and the resistor is the thing we want to generate current through. Of course, in reality, this is probably just a not just a resistor, but a washing machine, a computer, or a TV, or electric cattle prod, or whatever it is that you feel the need to run electric current through at home. Notice that the connection to the wire is through the commutator here, as we discussed in class. At the end of the current loop are these little thin brushes. These brushes are metal, so they make an electrical contact, but they're not held in place. They can sweep by the circular bit here as the current loop rotates. Rotates, there it goes. Um, so as you can see, um, the brushes are sometimes connected to one half of the circular bit, sometimes to the other half. That will allow a current that is one of the other direction in the wire loop correspond to a current that is always the same direction in the resistor, as we shall see. So, right. So, it's easier to see what's going on. Let's fade out the axes. I'm also going to fade out the full magnetic field. It's in the Z direction. We can remember that. When we need to think about it, I'll put in a little arrow showing the direction of the field right at the place where we care about it. All right. So, let's rotate this puppy. Go. Go. Rotate. I don't know why it's having so much trouble rotating. Go. Thank you. All right, as it goes around, I've got the brown arrows here showing you the direction of the magnetic field for convenience at the position of the left and right legs of current. Although, of course, the magnetic field is everywhere. The blue arrow just shows the direction that each side is moving. You can see that these arrows are always tangent to the circle that these sides are making. Now, because the wire is made out of metal, it has free charges in it. We know that these charges are actually electrons, but because current is defined as the flow of positive charge, as usual, we're going to have to deal with the fact that the current is opposite the direction of the free electron drift. So let's just pretend that the charge carriers are positive, and that will allow us to figure out the direction of current without having to keep track of flipping directions and negative signs. Ben Franklin, look what you've done to us! Rage! <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> feeling better now. Anyway, uh, there are free charges that can move within the metal, but that means that as the legs of the loop move around, shown by these darker blue arrows, the charges are moving in that direction as well. And because a magnetic field will exert a force on these moving charges, then these charges will have a force on them, and if that force has any component along the direction of the wire, it will result in charges moving along a wire, which is a current. So let's think about it. First, let's take a look at the front and back legs, get them out of the way. On this part here, the front leg, the part we're zoomed in on, the magnetic field is vertical, as always, and the motion of the, the piece of loop is at an angle. So the velocity of the charge and the magnetic field are not parallel, and thus V cross B will not be zero, as you can see. 
Well, working it out with the right hand, we can see the QV cross B is in the plus X direction out of the screen here, which is green, right? Which is perpendicular to the direction of the wire. That is, the charges are already moving perpendicularly because of the rotation of the loop, and the interaction of the motion with the magnetic field tries to get them moving perpendicularly in the other direction. This will not drive any current because the wire doesn't extend in that direction. Now if we look at all the other sides of the front and the back wire, we get the same thing. So let's not worry about the front and back wires anymore. So let's start with the loop flattened out with the magnetic field piercing the area enclosed by the loop perpendicularly. If the loop is going to rotate clockwise the way we've been seeing it, the leg on the left will be moving up and the leg on the right will be moving down as shown by the blue arrows here. The magnetic field everywhere is up. Again, the free charges in the wire are carried along with the wire loop's movement. So so these blue arrows mean that in the left leg there are free charges moving up in the plus z direction and in the right leg there are free charges moving downwards in the minus z direction. On the left the velocity of the charges is parallel to the magnetic field so QV cross B is going to be zero as the cross product of two parallel vectors is always zero. So there's no force on the charge as a result of this motion. Same thing on the right except that it's anti-parallel there. So that means there's no current flowing. We already did the front and back so there's no current flowing in this direction. If you look at the brushes you see that the gap in the commutator is positioned so that the brushes aren't touching anything right now. The real reason for that will come a bit later, but just notice that it sort of doesn't matter because there would be no current generated anyway. So there would have been nothing for the brushes to carry down to our resistor, so there's not a complete circuit. So let's let the ro loop rotate a bit clockwise and then freeze time and figure out what's happening here. Let's start with the top leg. Again, there's no current yet in the loop. The only motion of the free charge is the fact that being carried along with the turning of the loop. The blue arrow is that motion, the V and the QV, which is now up into the right. B is the brown arrow, is still up. This will create a force on the charge carriers that is in the plus X direction outwards. So, aha. Uh -huh. So now there is a force along the direction of the wire, so this will cause some current to flow in this direction indicated by the light blue arrows. All that we have to do is make sure that there's not something on the other leg that would cancel this out. So let's go down and look at it. Down here, magnetic field, still vertical. But of course, as the loop rotates clockwise, this leg is moving down and to the left, bringing the free charges inside it along with it. So we've got the blue arrow, and then we do the cross product down left, up, boom, we get a force into the screen in the minus x direction. So this will cause the current to flow like this, which is consistent. So hooray, we have loop flowing in the current the way we want. So as a result of the clockwise rotation of the wire loop inside this magnetic field, we get a current going around the loop this way. This is not the result of an external power supply connected to the loop. This is magnetic induction. The wire rotating through the magnetic field is what's inducing this current to flow. Righto. We want to figure out which way this will make current go through our resistor, so let's take a look at the commutator. Now the brushes are making electrical contact with this commutator. The top part of the commutator's circle is connected to the upper part of the square loop of wire, and that's what's going into the right side of this green wire. So the current will enter the right brush, go downwards toward the resistor. The bottom part of the commutator circle is connected to the other half of the square loop of wire, so current will come up out through the left wire from the resistor, through the brush, and into that loop. So at this particular orientation, with the loop moving clockwise, we have current going to the left through the resistor. See the little arrow? All right. Now, when the loop is vertical, the right-hand row will again give us the same sense for the current through the loop. Right? Burp, burp just to be figured out. And if we look at the commutator, we see that the rest of the circuit within the resistor is still connected to the current loop in the same way, so nothing will have changed. One thing to note here though, at this point the blue arrows, the motion of the charges as a result of the rotation of the loop of wire, are perpendicular in both cases to the magnetic field. They weren't before. Remember that the magnitude of a cross product is largest when the two vectors going into the cross product are perpendicular. Here, Q times V is perpendicular to B, so this will be the largest force we get any time during the rotation. That means at this orientation, the current is strongest as well, so we'll have the biggest current in the resistor. As we continue the rotation, we see at this next angle, the velocity blue and the magnetic field brown arrows are oriented such that the current keeps flowing the same way through the loop, although the loop is turned. The force is not as strong, but it's still keeping current flowing around the loop in the same sense. Over here on the left, QV cross B is into the screen. Over here on the right, out of the screen. Commutator, we see that we still have current going into the right wire and coming out of the left wire just like we did before. And so the right wire is connected to the loop. We've got the current going, all good.
All right, so if we let the thing rotate so that it's 180 degrees away from where we started, or pi radians, as I prefer to say, we're now in another situation where the motion of the two side legs is either parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field. All the QV cross B cross products will be zero, so you won't have any current flowing. And just like we started with the loop flat in the XZ plane, oriented upside down right now, the two brushes are temporarily not in contact with the commutator. No current is flowing anyway, open circuit, also no current, everything's zero. So good. All right, let's go further. Now, visually it looks basically the same as the first angle that we started with, but remember that the loop has flipped over, can't do that, and is upside down from where it was before. If the current were to stay in the same direction through the loop, when you turned it upside down, it would now be going into the screen in the top left and out of the screen in the bottom right. That's not what we have though. Look at the, little, the two little arrows. In the top left, UV cross B is out of the page, and uh, just like it was before. And down in the bottom right, QV cross B is into the screen. So we have current flowing like this. It looks just like the direction we had before, but from the point of view of the loop, the current has changed direction. And indeed, if we didn't have a commutator, but it just directly connected the loop to a resistor, the current would have changed. But you can see here, the gaps in the commutator have passed the brushes. The brushes are now connected with the opposite sides of the commutator from what they were before. However, because the current in the loop has also turned around, that means that the two changes offset each other. Notice that the current is coming in from the upper right part of the loop. It goes around the top half circle of the commutator and then down into the wire on the right side. It goes through the resistor, comes back up, and then goes back into the loop. So with the current going down the right side wire and up the left side wire, we still have a leftward current through the resistor. Right! All right, that's half the problem. So we've worked out you always get a leftward uh, thing through the resistor by considering the forces of the magnetic field on the charge carriers in the wire. That's what we get. All right. Now remember, the electrons are, are drifting in the opposite direction from the current because um, they're negative. Electrons are like grumpy cat. They're all, no. All right. So the second half of the problem has to do with Lenz's law. So what we're going to do is we're going to fade out all these little force arrows and such, because we've already considered that part of it. Fade. There we go. And then we fade in the magnetic field. Do we get the same current by considering Lenz's law? Lenz's law tells us that the direction of the EMF around a loop is such that any magnetic field produced by the loop would offset the change in the magnetic flex. Fuck, buh. Whatever. So, okay. I faded the full magnetic field back in so that we can think about the magnetic flux. Remember, the flux is the amount of like, uh, magnetic field crossing the area. This is related to the dot product, right? So we've got dot. Mm. So when they're parallel, it's max, so on and so forth. All right. So for maximum flux, you want the uh, direction along the neural. All right. So notice, as we get steeper, more and more vertical, fewer magnetic line field lines pierce the area. The dot product of the normal to the area in the magnetic field lines goes down as the normal gets more and more perpendicular to the dot product. Or normal is perpendicular to the area. Remember that unlike cross products, dot products are greatest when the two things are parallel, smallest when they're perpendicular. So the magnetic flux is upwards but decreasing. Lenz's law says that the induced current would be such that it creates a magnetic field to fight this change. Listen carefully here, as this is where a lot of people screw up. A lot of people would say, well, the magnetic field is going through the loop in the upward direction, so the induced current has to make it go as downwards as it can. That's wrong. Because the magnetic flux is upwards but decreasing, Lenz's law says that the current will fight the decrease, which means a current that would have to give a magnetic field through the loop upwards. A current like this, right? Now you notice it's sort of at an angle, but it's more up than down. So you can use the, there's two ways you can get this. You can use the curly right hand rule, orienting your thumb along the current for each of the four legs. Your fingers curl, point your thumb along the current, you see your fingers curl, and on the inside in each case they tell you the direction of the current. Um, you can also use the shirt hand, curl around and point. Okay, once the loop is turned over, the situation changes. The magnetic field is still upwards from the loop. It's always upwards, as it's a static magnetic field. The loop is now upside down in the sense that it's flipped over, but I'm going to keep calling the direction of the magnetic field upwards because that's what we see on our screen. So the magnetic field is upwards, but as it keeps going, the upwards magnetic flux is increasing with time. So the induced current would try to fight this increase, which means the induced current would give us a magnetic field from that current pointing downwards through the loop. 
So the sense of current shown with the little light blue arrows will accomplish this. You can use the sure hand, right hand rule again. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, and there you go. Or the short hand, right hand rule is the current's going around like this, magnetic field that way. All right. So good. So that's that's the direction of the current we get that fights a, the change in the upwards increase. If we take a look at the commutator, we can see that the current is still coming into the outside circuit such that it goes down the right side of the wire, comes back up the left side. This will be a current to the left in the resistor below just like we had before. In fact, seeing where the brushes are on the commutator, it's been doing that since we started talking about Lenz's law. But as it keeps rotating, the brushes will get past the gaps. Okay, so what happens now? Well, the magnetic field is still upwards, but the magnetic flux is now decreasing as the thing continues to rotate. So we need a current whose magnetic field would tend to fight this decrease, which we've had before, which means that a current would give us as much as possible in a magnetic or upwards magnetic field. So the short hand, right hand rule, it's a current in this way. And if we look at the commutator, now that the brushes have moved to the other sides, but also the current is turned around in the loop, we're still in a situation of current, down, current going down the right wire and coming back up the left wire, which is still a current to the left through the resistor below. So, whether we think about the individual forces on the charge carriers, or, you know, the charge carriers being carried along with the wire, or whether we consider Lenz's law in both cases, we can figure out a direction of magnetically induced current that, together with the action of the commutator, gives us current that is always to the left through the resistor. So as the thing goes round and round, round and round, please turn for me. It will very soon. Um, okay, right now, see, it's flat. There's no current right now because it's uh, horizontal, and horizontal is both ways we thought about it, whether it was the forces parallel to the magnetic field, whether the velocities parallel to the magnetic field, or this is where the flux is briefly not changing as the thing rotates, right? It goes from a little less to max to max to a little less than max again, so it's not changing. Either way of thinking about it, at this orientation, we don't have any current flowing, okay? But then as the thing starts to rotate around, there we go. So you notice it sort of oscillates, and notice that the arrow at the bottom gets longer and shorter, and all the arrows coming around get longer and shorter and kind of change direction from the point of view, at least, of this rotating thing. When it's vertical, the current is the biggest. When it's horizontal, it's the smallest and it oscillates in between. And in fact, if I were to plot this, which is the sort of thing I like to do, if I plot the current as a function of time, right, so it starts at zero, it's doing this, right? And so right here would be the horizontal loop. Here would be the vertical loop. Here is horizontal upside down loop. Here is vertical again, um, and now we're back to where we started, right? So in fact, if you plot the rotation of the loop, it takes all the way from here to here to go through one rotation of the loop, right? So it's, you know, you know. anyway, that's what the current through the resistor at the bottom would look like, as you can see, and that is the first problem. In the second problem, we have a loop of wire with a resistor in it that's a 10 ohm resistor. The wire is 10 centimeters on a side, so it's A by A, and A is 0.1 meters, is 10 centimeters. And the magnetic field, which is coming out of the page, it's written that way, um, is decreased from 0.5 tesla to 0 tesla steadily over 10 seconds. So what that says is at time t equals 0, B is 0.5 tesla. It, Time t equals 10 seconds, b is 0 tesla, steadily, steadily, meaning the rate of change of b doesn't change. Question, what is the current in the wire, direction and magnitude? Through the resistor, really. Okay, well first, we have a magnetic field, sorry, I should use my right hand, a magnetic field that is out, but decreasing. So according to Lenz's law, the induced current is going to try to fight the decrease. Magnetic field out, but decreasing. To fight the decrease, that would be a field out, a field in the, in the plus Z, or whatever you want to call it, the out of the board direction. To get that, if I use the shorthand right-hand rule, I need current going around this way, 
Or if you just use the straight up right hand roll, the curly right hand roll, current there, that way, points out, that way, points out, that way, points out, that way, points out. So we know that current is going to be like this. So I is to the right through the resistor. All right, now to figure out the size of the current, what we do know is that the EMF induced all the way around the loop, and this is why it's not a voltage, because remember the Kirchhoff's loop rule says that the delta V around a loop is zero. Now we're saying that there's a non-zero EMF around the loop. So Kirchhoff's laws don't work when you have changing magnetic fields. And then where is the EMF? Well, it's all the way around the loop. It's not at one place like when we draw a little battery. Now for, for circuit diagrams, you could sometimes approximate it that way, but really it's all the way around the loop. And we know that that is going to be, the magnitude of EMF will be the absolute value of delta phi B by delta T. And then phi B is just going to, in this case, be equal to B A squared, because it's the magnetic field, B, vector, dotted with the vector area. Well, the area, it's a square, side A, the area is lowercase a squared, and then the normal is in the same direction as the magnetic field, so B A squared, uh, or B dot A is just going to be the same as B times A because they're parallel vectors. Um, delta phi B, therefore, is going to equal 0 minus B A squared because at time T equals 10 seconds, B is 0. At time this, it's, we'll call it B naught. So we'll call that B naught. And delta T is of course 10 seconds. So the EMF we're going to get is going to be um, 0.5, well here I'll write it out first, is going to be the absolute value of B naught A squared divided by delta T, which is, really it's the absolute value of minus B naught A squared, but because it's absolute value it's the same thing. Uh, B naught is 0.5 Tesla, and then uh, A squared is 0.10 meters squared, and uh, delta T is 10 seconds. So this I actually ought to be able to do in my head, right? So it's 0 0.5 times, so that's 0 0.1 squared is 0 0.01 times 10 to the minus 2 times 10 to the minus 1. That's equal to, so this is 5 times 10 to the minus 1, 2, 3, 4. 5 times 10 to the minus 4. Now, I'm, I haven't written the units yet because I want to do them. So remember, a Tesla is the same as a Newton second per coulomb meter. And of course, a Newton is a kilogram meter, which will cancel that meter, per second squared, which will cancel that second, kilogram per coulomb second. So we have kilogram meter squared per because there's a meter squared there, seconds times the seconds from the Tesla, seconds squared coulombs, kilogram meter squared per second squared is joules, we have joules per coulomb, which is volts. So yes, we get the right units out of this. So the EMF is 5 times 10 to the minus 4 volts in this case, but what we're really after is the current, so we can use Ohm's law, the EMF pushing all the way around this loop, well the only place there's resistance is at the resistor. So the current is just going to equal the EMF over R, and so that's going to be 5 times 10 to the minus 4 volts divided by 10 ohms. So the current is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 amps is the same as 50 microamps, is the current that you would get in that case. That's the second problem. And the third problem, we have a region of magnetic field, B here, coming out of the page, as I think they all do in this problem set. Good magnetic field, but it's limited to here. So there's no magnetic field out here, out here, just in this region. The region is W wide. Uh, oh, I even tell you what W is. Look at that. W is 0 0.40 meters. Okay, and the magnetic field strength is 0.35 Tesla. Okay, uh, the square loop of wire is A on a side where A is 12 centimeters, so it's 0.12 meters, so notice A is less than W, probably drew it about right there. Um, 
the wire loop speed is maintained at 15 meters per second. So whatever is necessary to keep it moving at 15 meters per second, we are doing that. Um, and finally, there's a resistance all the way around the wire, um, either because there's resistors in it or just because of what the wire is made out of and how long it is. For whatever reason, there's a resistance in the wire of 2.5 ohms. Good. Plot the current that runs through the loop as a function of time. Label your plot numerically. Define positive current to be the direction indicated in the picture. Right? So there's no current yet, but if it's going around that way, right? so if it's going around like this, that's positive. If it's going the other way, we'll call that negative. All right, so when is there going to be a current? Well, when it's flying free out here in the region of no magnetic field, there's no forces, there will be no current. However, there is a time that will come when the loop is entering the magnetic field. All right. Let's call t equals zero when it first hits the edge. All right. So at t equals zero, right there, is when the edge of the magnetic field just starts to enter the, or sorry, the edge of the loop just starts to enter the edge of the magnetic field. Well, okay. So now what we want to do is we want to figure out what is the magnetic flux through this. Well, the magnetic field is just B. The perpendicular to the area is straight out, so the dot product is going to be easy. It's just, it's just going to be multiplying the area times the flux. And then the area is A vertically by what is this length? That length is VT. Right? Because when T equals zero, that length is zero. And then this front side moves forward with X equals velocity times time, because velocity is constant. So that length is just the speed times the time. Okay, so now we know that the magnetic flux is just going to be B times A times V times T. That's great. What is the change of the magnetic flux with time? Delta phi B over delta T. Oh, well, that's actually pretty easy because this T really is what this delta t is, sort of. I mean, honestly, it's so hard to say this without doing a derivative. Ugh! But I'm trying to avoid talking about calculus. So let's just think about how much does phi change if we move forward a little, you know, suppose it moves this. Here is v delta t. Well, so delta phi in that time is going to be a v delta t, right? It started at one thing, and then you add this much area to it. So the area changed by that much. So delta phi b by delta t is just b a v. That's great. And we can actually work that number out because it's 0.35 tesla times a is 0.12 meters times 15 meters per second. I'll do that on my calculator because I don't think I can do that in my head. So that's 0.63 volts. Right? That's what delta phi, that's what the EMF is. Um, and so I is going to be 0.63 volts divided by 2.5 ohms, which is 0.25 amps. Okay, that's the magnitude of the current. What is the direction? Well, the magnetic flux is out and increasing out. Right? Because as it goes in, there's more and more of these field lines piercing it. It's a bigger and bigger area. So as it goes in, flux is out, it's increasing out. So therefore, the induced current would create a magnetic field to oppose that increase, which would be a positive induced current, because it would have to go around this way. Right? Using the shorthand, right hand roll, curl your fingers along with the current, the magnetic field would be that way. So now we know at t equals zero, we're going to have um, a magnetic field, uh, or sorry, a current of plus, because that's the direction of positive current, 0.25 amps. How long will it last? Well, let's think about, uh, there's going to be some later time when the loop is all the way inside, and now the magnetic flux is not changing, right? As the loop moves, it's the same magnetic field. The entire area is covered. There's no change in magnetic flux. So there'll be no EMF, so there will be no current. And that starts, if this is t equals zero, the time when the loop is completely in, that's when the current, that's when you'll no longer have a change. Well, we can just figure that out because it has to move distance A so that the back goes from here to here. So A has to be equal to V times, we'll call this T1, or T1 
is equal to a over v. Notice this a is a length, not an acceleration. That's just how we defined it. All right, and so that we can do because it's 0.12 meters divided by 15 meters per second. So let's see, that's four fifths or 0.08 yes, I think, seconds. Did I do that right? Um, right, because 0.12 is 12 times 10 to the minus 2. Yeah, I did it right. It's 12 times 10 to the minus 2, and 12 fifteenths is 4 fifths. Sorry, 3 fifths. This should have been a 6. No, 4 fifths, because 3 times 4 is 12, and 3 times 5 is 15. So I'm dividing both by 3. So we get 4 fifths, which is 0.8. So we have 0.8 times 10 to the minus 2. So that's 0 0.008 seconds. Good. So at 0 0.008 seconds, the current drops to 0. And that will continue from here to here. right? As the loop moves from here to here, so the total distance the loop has to move, the front of the loop, is a distance of w minus a. All right, to get from here to here. So this is T1. To get to the point where the loop starts to leave, this whole time the current is zero because the loop's just moving within the magnetic field and there's no net force on the charges in it. So let's figure out what um, V times T2 minus T1, right? That, this is time T1, this is time T2. So delta T is T2 minus T1, and then delta X is W minus A, equals W minus A. So therefore, T2 is equal to T1 plus W minus A over V, okay, which is equal to 0 0.008 seconds plus 0 0.40 meters minus 0.12 meters divided by 15 meters per second. 0.4 minus 0.12 is 0.28. Uh, I'm not going to reduce this in my head. I'm going to use a calculator. I'm lazy. All right. So this happens at 0 0.027 seconds. Right. So 8 times 4 would be, sorry, 8 times 3 would be 24. So this, I actually probably should have drawn this a little closer here. So this is 0 0.00. So it's, it was 0 there, 0 0.008. And about 3 times as long. So 1, 2, 3. Um, it's the current's going to be zero all that time here, so about 0 0.027 seconds. Now we have to think about when it's leaving. So when it's leaving, which starts here at T2, now it's on the way out. So let's think in time delta T, it will move a distance V delta T. Right? That's how far it's going to move. So therefore, the change in the area is going to be, you know, this is how much the area changes, because it used to be all this. Now it's just the, the smaller one. So that change in the area is, is A times V delta T. Right? It's A by V delta T. That's the change in the area during time delta T. Um, so we're going to get exactly the same thing. We're going to have B, A, V, delta T. So it's going to be exactly the same. It's going to be the 0.25. But let's think about the direction. We have a magnetic field that's out, but the flux is now decreasing because as it goes out, less and less and less of the magnetic field is pointing through the area. So we need a current to offset the decrease. That current would be whichever one would give a magnetic field that way. That's going to be current going around this way. Notice at the top it's that way, which is opposite I. So we're going to get a minus... 0.25 amps. This is I. These are seconds. This is T we're plotting here. And it's going to last for the same amount of time because it'll take the same 0.008 seconds to go from here to here as it did to go from here to here. It still has to go a distance A. So 0.27 seconds plus 0.008 seconds, 0.035 seconds. And the current will be zero again. So this is what the current induced in that loop would look like. As it comes in, you have. So the high thing, that's a positive current. Nothing, nothing, nothing. That's a negative current, meaning going the other way. Okay, that's that problem.
let's just dive straight into the fourth problem. What do you say? Actually, you know what? I'm going to start a new clip so that the memory, the for reasons. All right, so we have the same situation from last time, and in fact, everything we worked out last time, uh, that there's an induced current. So this comes in here. There's an induced current. Um, we worked out that it was in that direction just in the previous problem. There's no current while it's inside, but then on the way out, there's an induced current that way. This problem, show that a force is needed sometimes to keep the loop of wire moving at 15 meters per second. And that's, this really isn't too hard to do, because and this, is, uh, this came up in class. Think about, so we've got charges moving around like this induced by this magnetic field. So what's going to happen? So these charges here moving that way, well, they're going that way, and there's a magnetic field that way. And if I do QV cross B, or IL cross B, I get a force this way as a result of the interaction of the induced current with the magnetic field. So as this thing comes in, two things happen. First, it induces a current, and second, that induced current um, actually decelerates this, has a force that way that would decelerate this. So you have to exert a force in the opposite direction somehow. Maybe you're pulling on it, right, most obvious way. Somehow you have to exert a force in the opposite, opposite direction to keep it going at 15 meters per second. Otherwise, it would slow down because of this force. And if you think about it from the point of view of energy, there's a current flowing, I. I don't remember what I calculated. But there's a current flowing. There's an EMF. You can use IV to calculate the power that's being dissipated. Remember, power is energy per time. So the, during the time it's coming in, multiply that power by time. You have an amount of energy that's dissipated. Where did that energy come from? Conservation of energy. Well, it came from the kinetic energy of the wire moving. So you could figure out that the kinetic energy of the wire has to go down by the right amount in order to offset that. That's mostly where it comes from. It turns out, I think, that when you do this, that it won't be conservative. So what will happen is um, there's actually more kinetic energy lost, I believe, um, because of this force. I'd have to work this out, but it may be that there's more kinetic energy lost and there's even more heat than you would have expected, but I don't know. So leave that aside for the moment and I'll work it out and tell you later. And, or probably I won't, and come ask me. Good, so that's fine. If you look at this case, it's the same thing. There's a current that way, I, L cross B. There is a force this way. So both on the way in and on the way out, the induced currents are in opposite directions. So there is a force pulling back on the loop. So you have to do some, you have to exert a force to offset that force to keep it at 15 meters per second. And I was gonna say, you can't actually work out what this force is, because we worked out what the induced current was Remember, the induced current was B, A, V, B, A, lowercase v, um, over the resistance of the wire, right? That's what the induced current was, because B, A, V was the induced EMF, and R, R, I equals EMF. So that's the induced current, and we can figure out, right, the force is I, L hat, sorry, I, L vector, cross B vector. Well, so I, L, we already figured out the direction. It's perpendicular. So this is just going to be I, A, B, which is equal to, and notice I'm going to plug in I, so I have B squared, A squared V over R is the magnitude of the force. And you can then put your numbers in. Um, so all of these are givens at this point. So, so that's how much force you would have to exert to keep this thing going at the same rate. By the time I had drawn this F error, I was done with the problem as written. Show that a force is needed, right? You induce this current. This current interacts with the magnetic field, giving a force that way. You have to offset it to keep the loop moving. And this actually is how much force you need to keep it moving. That's the end of the fourth problem. Don't worry about all the rest of that stuff. We're done for this week.